Welcome to another tutorial video. You're gonna learn about convertible preferred stock in leverage buyouts and LBO models in this lesson. Now, I do wanna start with a quick announcement and say that as with last year, we are running a Black Friday slash Cyber Monday slash Cyber Week sale. You can get into all the details on our courses page, which I'll link to below this video. I'll pin that link so you can access it. If you scroll to the comments and click on it, it'll be the first thing there. The sale, which includes all of our courses at a discounted price, expires on Monday, December 2nd, the end of this Cyber Week period at 11.59 p.m. New York time. But if you sign up before then, you can get a pretty substantial discount on all of our courses together. As for this topic of convertible preferred stock, we've previously covered a lot of LBO models and concepts in this channel, but we haven't explored all of the advanced features and concepts that you might run into. And one of the most common ones is convertible preferred stock. This video will cover the assumptions and the exit calculations, which is actually the hardest part by far about setting this up in a model. You can get the written version and the Excel file via the link in the pinned comment or on the next slide. The URL here is very long, so I will pin this below the video along with a link to our Cyber Week sale and you can get everything from here. So in this tutorial, I'm gonna start with a three minute summary of convertible preferred stock. Then we'll go into the assumptions and the model setup. Then we'll talk about the exit calculations and then I'll explain how you can change the formulas to avoid circular references here. So convertible preferred stock in an LBO gives the investor some downside protection if the deal doesn't perform well, but it's also not a complete disaster. Maybe it just has mediocre results of a 5% or 10% annualized return or something like that. If the deal does perform well, maybe it gets to a 20 or 25 or 30% IRR, then the convertible preferred stock investors can convert into common shares and get that same IRR as a result. Typically, convertible preferred stock has some type of preferred dividend coupon rate attached, which is usually accrued or paid in kind, which means it's not paid in cash. Instead, it just boosts the convertible preferred balance each year. That effectively gives them a certain annualized return, such as 12%, if the coupon rate on it is 12%. If the IRR in a deal is disappointing, so the private equity investors earn a 5% IRR, then the convertible preferred investors can stay in preferred and earn maybe a 12% IRR in the exit if they have a 12% coupon rate. I'm gonna bring up the Excel file right now and show you. So the, in this file, we're using a multiple of one times EBITDA for the convertible for preferred initially. So it starts out at 50 million. If you look at the exit calculations here and you go to year one where we exit for a 10X EBITDA multiple, you can see it laid out very clearly. The common equity investors get a negative 11% IRR, so they actually lose money in the deal, but the convertible preferred investors get a 12% IRR because they had a 12% coupon rate, and so that's their annualized return in this case, even though the common equity investors, the private equity firm, have done much worse. If the IRR is much higher, such as 20% or 25%, then the convertible preferred investors convert to common shares and get that return instead. And again, you can see it right here where in some of these later exit years where the multiple is much higher, the common equity investors get around a 20% IRR and so do the convertible preferred investors because in the exit calculations, it is of course in their interest to convert into common shares in this case so they can get a much higher exit value and that boosts their return and makes it in line with that of the common equity investors. Now there are some limits to this, Private equity firms can only use so much convertible preferred to fund these deals. And similar to liquidation preferences, it doesn't really help if the deal is a total disaster where they lose everything or they lose 90% or something like that. In an extreme case like that, everyone is going to lose money except for maybe some of the senior most lenders. So there are some limits, but this is the basic concept. So I'm now going to go through this step-by-step. Step. I'm going to start by going back to the Excel file and just wiping out all of the assumptions here, and then re-entering them, and I'll show you how we can set this up from scratch, starting with the formulas at the top. Okay, so here I am with a wiped version where I've eliminated most of the assumptions relating to the convertible preferred. I'm going to go through the formulas now step-by-step step, and explain each one, starting with the assumptions and the model flow and setup. I do have a summary here in PowerPoint, but essentially we need to know how much convertible preferred we're using, what the conversion price is, the potential shares, and the coupon rate. On the income statement, we'll deduct the preferred dividends from net income to get net income to common. We'll add them back as a non-cash item on the cash flow statement, just like paid in kind interest. And then on the balance sheet, the convertible preferred balance will increase by these preferred dividends each year. So let's go through the model and set up some of this. The first thing we need to decide on is the offer price per share, because this will determine the conversion price per share for the convertible preferred. 
We can take the purchase equity value and divide by the share count pre-deal. So it's $10 per share for the offer price. And then for the convertible preferred used, we'll take our 1x multiple here and just multiply it by the company's EBITDA pre-deal of 50 million. So we have 50 million of convertible preferred. The conversion price is usually set equal to the offer price per share in a deal like this. So it's $10. And then the convertible preferred shares, we take the balance that's being used and then divide by the conversion price and we get to 5 million total shares like that. We can then reflect this in the sources and uses schedule, which is already set up to do that. And then we can also look at the ownership and see how the convertible preferred investors here end up effectively owning 12% on a fully diluted basis. Now, of course, if the deal doesn't perform to a certain level, they will not actually get any of this. The private equity firm will still own 100%, but if the deal does well, they will in fact get around 12% in the exit. Now, moving down, on the income statement, we have net income here at the bottom. And what we need to do is go to the convertible preferred balance of 50 million and then multiply by the 12% preferred coupon rate right up there. So let's take this and copy it across. And then we can subtract the convertible preferred dividends from the net income to get our net income to common. I can tell Excel to ignore these errors. On the cash flow statement, we linked to net income to common. And then we add back the convertible preferred dividends here because these are assumed to be accrued or paid in kind. And then we go down and for the convertible preferred balance itself, we take the old number and then we simply add the accrued convertible preferred dividends. And so we have that. We can see the dividends here going up each year, but there is no real cash flow impact because these don't affect taxes. And since they're non-cash, we add them back on the cash flow statement. So there's really no cash impact from any of this. But that's the basic flow and set up on the statements. It's not too terribly complicated. Where it gets harder is with the returns and exit calculations here at the end. I have a summary in PowerPoint here of what we're gonna do, but we need to change the bridge calculations around and separate out some of the different line items. We need to calculate the diluted share count and the common share price in the exit. We then need to compare the accrued value of the convertible preferred. So it's balance sheet value to its value when converted into common shares. Then we need to decide whether or not the investors convert to common or stay in preferred. This will create a circular reference. And then we deduct the convertible preferred in the bridge and count it as either debt, meaning there's no conversion, or as equity, meaning that the investors did convert into common shares. And we use the switch and the mini schedule that we set up to do this. Finally, we can then calculate the IRRs and multiples, and we can look at them for the common equity investors, the convertible preferred investors, or some type of blended return if we assume that the same group has invested in the company via both methods. So let's go in and start setting this up. The equity value to enterprise value bridge here is actually already fine. We've already separated out the cash. We've already separated out the non-convertible debt. And we just have some blanks here for the convertible for preferred. We don't know if it's gonna be treated as debt or equity quite yet. So these are blank for now. We've calculated our exit equity value and then our proceeds to the private equity firm, the common equity investors here at the bottom. So for the next step of this, we need to figure out what the conversion decision is going to be. So I'm gonna start by going to the diluted shares at standing area here at the bottom. I will link to the common shares from our fully diluted ownership schedule right up here. By the way, the common share count here is just based on the investor equity, the 372 million divided by the offer price per share in the deal of $10 per share. So that's where the share count here is coming from. For the convertible preferred shares, we simply take our switch here that tells us whether we convert to common, this is a one or a zero. And then we multiply by the number of convertible preferred shares, which I've calculated up here, the 5 million. That'll get us the total diluted shares outstanding. And then for the common share price, we can take our exit equity value and then divide by the diluted shares outstanding right here. So we're just calculating the price and the exit, and we're effectively going to use this to decide whether or not the investors here actually convert into common shares. Now for the next part in this, we need to compare the values of these two items. So let's start by pulling in the convertible preferred balance from our simplified balance sheet or simplified tracking of the capital structure. And then for its value as common shares, we will take the common share price down here, and then we'll multiply by the convertible preferred share count of 5 million right up there, and we have that. And we can copy this across. And so you can see here how in the first year, they should probably stay in convertible preferred but then the second year, they should convert to common shares. And then every year after that, they should convert to common shares. So for the switch to decide, it's pretty simple. We just look at the value as common shares. And if this is greater than the accrued value, we convert. 
Otherwise, we do not, and I'm using ones and zeros to represent this decision. Now, this creates a circular reference, which you can tell via the calculate label at the bottom. So you'll want to go into Excel, Alt-T-O for the options menu, or Command comma on the Mac, go to formulas, and then make sure enable iterative calculations is checked for this part. This creates a circular reference because whether we convert depends on the share price, but the share price depends on the diluted shares. The diluted shares depend on the conversion decision. So we get a circular reference here cropping up. I will copy this across for now. And you can see how it correctly detects that we should not convert in the first year, but then we should convert in every single year after that. And now for the last part, treating this in the bridge. So we want to take the accrued value of the convertible preferred if we're going to count it as debt and then multiply by one minus the switch right here. So this just says that if we don't convert to common, then we do want to count this as debt in this bridge and subtract it right here. But if we convert to common, then we don't want to have anything here. So this will just be zero in that case. And then for the treatment as equity, let's take our value as common shares and then multiply by the conversion switch once again. Copy this across, copy this across, and so we have that. And so you can see exactly how it works. We do not convert in the first year, but we do convert in every single year after that, and that handles it correctly. And then you can go down and see the IRRs and multiples that I showed you before. So that is how this works. Now there is one other issue here, which is that we do get a circular reference here because of the relationship between all these terms where we need to know how many shares there are to decide whether or not the conversion takes place, but whether the conversion takes place also depends on how many shares there are. So circular references make models less stable and more difficult to modify. And so if you have them in a model, you always wanna build in the option to disable them as well. Here, one trick for doing that is that we can look at the initial investor equity, the initial common equity, and then escalate it at the rate of return on the convertible preferred stock, and then compare that number to the exit equity proceeds, assuming the convertible preferred is treated as debt. And if this exit proceed number is greater, then it means that we should convert into common shares. If not, then it means that we are probably not going to get a 12% return on the common equity, and so we should stay in preferred. So it's really just a test and a quick, simple trick to approximate whether or not the common equity portion of this is getting at least a 12% IRR. We do need to add a circular reference switch at the top to do this and also modify the convert to common switch at the bottom in the model in the returns calculations. So let's go back into Excel. Now, right now, this part with circular references allowed is set to one, but it's not actually linked to anything in the model. I'm going to change this to zero for now so I can show you how the removal process works. And then let's go down to where we have the switch for convert to common. This is okay if we have circular references enabled. So let's do a check in the beginning and I'll say if circ ref, that named cell that I just set to zero. So if this is set to one, then we'll just go through this formula as we normally would. We create a circular reference and everything is fine. We accept it and we move on. If however, circular references are not enabled, then we do a slightly different check. And in this case, we want to sum up everything right here, the exit enterprise value, the cash, the non-convertible debt, and then we want to subtract the accrued value of the convertible preferred balance. So in other words, we're treating convertible preferred as debt in this calculation. And so if this exit equity proceed number is greater than the common equity escalating at that 12% rate of return, then we will convert into common shares. Otherwise, we will not. And of course, we need to bring in this line. So let's go up and get our investor equity right there. We can also get it from here, the equity balance, it doesn't really matter. And then we can just increase this by one plus the rate of return, the coupon rate on the convertible preferred stock each year. Copy this across. And then let's copy across our formula here for the convert to common. We can see that in this case, it correctly detects the difference. In the first year, it says no. And then every year after that, it says yes, because it always benefits us to convert to common in those cases. You can also see if you look at the bottom left of the screen that the calculate reference, the text there is gone because we've now removed the circular reference. Now, if you change this around a little bit and you try 10.5x and go to 11 and go to 11.3, you can see that we always get the correct conversion decision right here if you look at the accrued value and the value is common shares. There are some cases where you get to borderline cases and this may not work perfectly, but overall it works fairly well, even if it's maybe a little, bit, a little bit less precise than the real method using circular references. So that's how you can remove the circular references here. Let's do a quick recap and summary now.
Oh, convertible preferred stock at a high level gives investors some level of downside protection, not perfect downside protection, but some level. If the deal just doesn't do that well, but it still has some type of positive return, they can at least get their rate of return on the convertible preferred stock. And if the deal does quite well, they can convert into equity in that case and get the common equity IRR. In the model, you need assumptions for the coupon rate, the number of shares the convertible preferred stock can convert into. And then to set it up, you need to deduct the convertible preferred dividends and then add them back because they're usually accrued. And so they don't really make a cash flow impact. The hard part is the exit calculations. And there you have to calculate the diluted share count in the exit and the share price in the exit. Then you have to make a conversion decision. Do the convertible preferred stockholders convert into common or do they stay in preferred? And you have to base it on the accrued value of the preferred versus what it would be if you treated it as common stock and had a conversion. And you decide based on that. And then you subtract either the debt in the bridge at the end or the common equity value. If you want to remove the circular references that come up, you can use a trick where you simply escalate the common equity in, this, in the initial deal based on the coupon rate on the convertible preferred. And then you compare it to the exit equity proceeds, assuming that you treat the convertible preferred as debt. And if the equity IRR is greater than the coupon rate on the convertible preferred, you convert to common. Otherwise, you stay in preferred. So that's about it for this tutorial. Hopefully now you know a little bit more about convertible preferred stock and how it works in leverage buyout models.